Welcome back to Biology 206. So we are going to take our um, investigation up one level and move into uh, the community section. So previous to this, we've been looking at species um, and their interactions, species responses to the environment, species interactions with one another. And now we're moving up to this um, level of the community. Okay, my name is Dr. Jennifer Baltzer and we are going to get started. And just a little reminder, I know I mentioned this in both uh, the synchronous lecture and in uh, a note on the class website, but we're just reorganizing the order of our readings. So instead of going from um, biotic interactions to ecosystems to communities, we're going to go from biotic interactions, which we covered last week, ending at um, mutualisms and go straight into communities. So we'll cover chapters 16 and 17 and then we'll shift into ecosystems in chapter 21. And also just a reminder that we have our third uh, visiting scientist coming this week, Dr. Diana Strahl, who will be joining us Thursday at 5.30 in our synchronous lecture session. So please make sure you come out and join that. Okay, so getting started, what is a community? Well, the definition for your text is a group of interacting species that occur together at the same place and time. So if you remember, we have species, we have communities, we have ecosystems. Our communities are the species and their interactions amongst one another. The ecosystem is those species and their interactions plus the abiotic environment. And so we'll move up to that level um, after, after we get through this material. And we see depicted here four different types of communities, a desert, a hot spring, a kelp forest, which we've heard a little bit about already, and a coral reef. And you can see in these images lots of different species, whether it's different species of, of plants in this desert environment, uh, different species, you can imagine all the microbes that are occurring in that hot spring environment, uh, the fish and the kelp and um, the various um, invertebrates that would be in the system or this really diverse system of, of corals and um, fish and turtles and, and various other things that we see here. So lots of different species occurring together in space and time. So they're, they're at the same time, they're in the same place, they're, they're interacting with one another in some way. So the, the challenge is understanding what species are interacting with one another. And so, so the reality of defining communities is that in practice we often delineate communities by physical or biologic characteristics. So in the case of the hot springs here, we would define that community as that, that immediate hot spring environment and everything that occurred within it. Okay, so, it, so the easiest way to kind of delineate, you know, these closed aquatic systems are a really easy way to delineate a community, anything within that you know, closed system. It becomes a little harder when you have an open system like coral reef or kelp forest, but from a biologic perspective, then your community would be in the kelp forest or the coral reef would be those those species that are living in and using that, that kelp environment likewise for the coral reef. And the desert community might be all of those species that actually occur in that in that patch of desert. So there's sort of a physical delineation that has to happen somehow um, to define where that community begins and ends. And, and that's typically not done using measurements of direct species interactions, but rather some physical or biological metric that we can use to um, characterize that. Okay. So for much of the remainder of the lecture, we're going to be talking about different ways we characterize communities and the interactions of species within those communities. Okay, so first of all, a lot of times when we're studying a community, we're not studying all of the species within the community. It may be the case that you're interested in some component of the community where, where all of those organisms, all of those species share some evolutionary lineage. And that would be, you know, we would talk about, you know, species that have some taxonomic affinity. 
And in this case, so in this example, we would say, you know, um, the community, the forest bird community. So you can sort of define some subset of the community based on their um, taxonomy or some aspect of their function or their behavior, okay? So in this case, we'd talk about the forest bird community. Maybe we talk about the, the pollinators, um, the pollen eating uh, organisms. And so in this case, we have three taxonomically very diverse species. We have a bat, a bird, a bee. Um, they're not taxonomically similar, but they all functionally use similar parts of this system. They all consume pollen, they all pollinate flowers. And so um, in this case, we could talk about a guild. And so this guild is pollen eating animals. And so it's a group of species that use the same resources. That's, that's when we talk about a guild. Okay, or we can talk about, you could also think about, I mean, this is, this is an interesting um, comparison because we can also talk about a functional group, all right? And in this case, we have uh, uh, various nitrogen fixing plants. They are all performing a particular function for that community. They're fixing atmospheric nitrogen using um, partners that they have on their roots, uh, microbial partners that they have on their roots that help them fix nitrogen from the air and incorporate that into their tissues. Um, so when we're talking about functional groups, there's species that function in similar ways within the community, but may or may not have resource overlap. Okay, so they may not um, be, be competing with one another for resources, but they may perform a very similar function in the community. So when we go back to this guild of pollen eating animals, you could also imagine them being classified under as a functional group because they're all pollinators. So they're all consuming pollen, but they're all also going around and, and sh spreading pollen from one plant to another. Um, and uh, in that way, performing a similar function, right? So just, just another example of how if you, if you kind of flip this on its head and you think about the function that they're performing instead, um, you could consider these to be a functional group. And of course, they're, all of these, you know, these three species, they're, they're, they're adapted to use different types of flowers. And so in that context, they, they don't necessarily have resource overlap, but they're performing a similar function. So just an, another example of how you could, you could shift this one if you think about the function as opposed to the resource that they're after. Okay. So we also often think about trophic interactions when we are thinking about communities. So this gives us a measure of kind of the community structure, right? And we've already seen some examples of food webs um, in previous lectures, but this will, will just walk through this sort of quickly. So this is a typical structure. This is typically how we set up our food webs. So it goes from the, the, the base of the food web up to the, the apex of the food web. So here we have these green ones. These are plants, they're, some, they're autotrophs of some sort, okay? So these are primary producers, autotrophs. They are taking energy from the sun, carbon dioxide, and creating, um, creating energy. And I guess these could also be chemoautotrophs. Um, they don't necessarily need to be um, Photoautotrophs. So we have our autotrophs down here at the base of the food web. Typically in most food webs, these will be, will be plants, um, algae, things like that. Um, and then in our second level, we have our herbivores. So we thought about this, I, the, the, the unit we talked about this in was the uh, predation unit. Okay, so we have our primary producers. Second level, we have our herbivores. These are primary consumers, okay? So primary consumers, are those organisms that are consuming primary producers, all right? And so energy moves from the primary producers up to the primary consumers. And sometimes you can have, you know, two herbivores feeding on the same primary producer. In this case, we'd have competition between those herbivores. Okay, then we have our third level. These are secondary consumers. These are carnivores that feed on um, herbivores. Um, or, in some cases, these can be omnivores. So we see this direct link from the primary producer up to C1. So C1 is feeding on 
H1, but it's also feeding on P1, all right? So a great example of that would be, you know, black bears. Black bears will consume a wide variety of plant, um, uh, plant materials, but they also feed on a range of primary consumers. Um, and they'll also, you know, at, at times feed on other um, carnivores, okay? So, um, omnivores, uh, that's what we have reflected here. So we have our third level is our secondary consumers, and then our fourth level is our tertiary consumers, or sometimes these might be referred to as apex predators. Um, and so this is at the top of the food web, and so you can imagine the energy flowing from um, these primary consumers through the primary, sorry, from the primary producers through the primary consumers up into these secondary consumers and finally to the tertiary or apex um, consumers. And so this is what we refer to when we talk about um, trophic interactions and this is a great example of a, of a food web. So this is a representation of the trophic or energetic connections amongst species within the community, okay? So the direction of the arrow indicates the direction that energy is flowing from one organism to another, um, or one uh, trophic level to another. Uh, and so energy flows upward through this food web right up to the top of the, the, top of the food chain. Okay, and so trophic levels are groups of species that have similar ways of interacting and obtaining energy. So again, when you think about this, our primary producers are all creating their own um, carbohydrates from an energy source and carbon dioxide. Herbivores are exclusively feeding on those primary producers. So, so again, all of these herbivores get lumped into the same trophic level um, as do all of these primary producers because they are um, obtaining energy in a similar way, okay? So, food webs. Okay, now in you know, a, a criticism of food webs can be that they really are, are a little too simplistic in terms of the interactions that they reflect. And so really what is reflected in a food web is this vertical transmission of energy, right? So vertical transfer of energy from one trophic level to another. Now in contrast, we can think about interaction webs. And so interaction webs include non-trophic or horizontal interactions as well. And these can be any number of interactions. These could be um, competitive interactions, for example, these could be uh, um, horizontal exchanges of energy. So if we think about, um, you know, this, this particular uh, H3, maybe this is a detritivore. If you recall, detritivores are um, grouped in with herbivores because they are consuming, they're breaking down, they're, they gain their energy from primary producers. Um, and so you can imagine a situation where either a herbivore consumes a detritivore or a detritivore breaks down a herbivore. Um, and uh, so you can have these, these horizontal exchanges of energy in addition to the vertical exchanges of energy. So down here, perhaps this is a competitive interaction uh, or perhaps it's mediated via a mycorrhizal association. So we can certainly see situations where um, there's, there's directional transfer of, of carbon, for example, from um, one individual to another via mycorrhizal associations. So this could actually be a, tr you know, a trophic exchange via a mycorrhizal partner. Um, and, and then this is the example I was talking about earlier, where if this is our black bear, we know our black bear consumes berries and, and various uh, plant materials. We know our black bear consumes insects and different, uh, different herbivorous um, organisms. But on occasion, a black bear will also, um, will also consume a carnivore if, if, the, if the opportunity arises. Uh, so, so you can have these situations where you uh, can have horizontal transfers of, of energy from uh, within a level for a variety of reasons. And, and these interaction webs do a really good job capturing, um, capturing those vertical 
and hor those vertical and horizontal exchanges of, of energy as well as other interactions that may uh, that may occur within uh, amongst species within a community. Okay, so we can think about the interactions of species within a community and energy exchange amongst species and the types of functions that species perform and all of these different things, but one really simple way of characterizing a community is by looking at what species are in the community and this is species richness. So this is the simplest way to describe a community is just list the species in it. So if we take a look at this particular um, uh, drawing from your text we have uh, depicted in this in this drawing we have four different species of butterfly blue orange pink and yellow okay so if we went into that community and we uh, wanted to describe the, the butterfly community you know we talked about those different portions of the community the forest bird community so if we want to describe the butterfly community in this particular situation we'd have four different species and so if we so if we walked through and sampled um, butterflies in this community we would find those four species and the species richness is the number of species in the community so in this case for this butterfly community we'd have we'd have four species this is really the, uh, you know, the, the first pass at estimating species diversity, and we'll get into what species diversity is in a moment. And the way you do this is pretty straightforward. Um, we use the types of sampling approaches that we talked about in, um, in, earlier, uh, in earlier lectures where we, we talked about how to uh, sample the abundance. Okay, and this can be quadrat, it depends on your species, it can be quadrat based methods, it can be capture mark recapture methods, it can be distance based sampling methods. All of these different methods allow you to w move through a community, define what the area is that you're sampling, and identify species within that area. Okay, and so you define the boundaries of the community, you walk through it seasonally. This is important, you walk through it seasonally. This is, this is important because for a number of reasons. Number one, maybe you have some migratory species that aren't there every season. Maybe you have some species that are very apparent in certain seasons. So if we think about the understory of a temperate forest here in Ontario, um, if you go in in April, you'll find just an amazing diversity of what we refer to as spring ephemerals. These are small, pretty innocuous plants for most of the, the, the year but they produce their leaves and flower very early in the spring before the canopy flushes. And um, if, you, if you go into a forest, a temperate forest in this region at that time, the diversity of these, these flowers in the forest is, is really quite amazing. And for a lot of those, they'll capture all of their carbon during that time. And then they'll either just, you know, they'll, they'll either kind of die off for the rest of the summer because then they'll get shaded out and there's nothing more for them to do, or they become very inconspicuous and hard to detect. Um, so if you go through in the spring, you would see all of these different species. If you go through later in the summer, you might not notice them, um, or you might not be able to identify them. Okay. So taking a seasonal approach to this is important. And, um, uh, it's also important to recognize limitations to this method. So, for example, sampling intensity. If you walk through a forest one time, you will identify a certain number of species there. If you walk through it 20 times, you will notice many, many more species. Um, and you cannot compare those two efforts because on the one hand, you've only walked through one time. Um, so if you find five species one time and 30 species the next time, it's not because one, you know, and you do those let's let's say you're comparing two forests and you walk through one forest and you do your sampling one time you you sample in the other forest 20 times um, you find greater richness in the forest that you sample 20 times but that is not because there's a difference in richness between those two forests it's really because of the sampling intensity you have put more effort into um, looking for species in that second forest compared to the first forest and so you really have to be very careful and we'll see some some graphs of this in a few slides, you really have to be careful to put equal effort into your sampling um, in order to ensure that you're, you know, you are um, 
the differences in richness that you're detecting are because of true differences in, in richness in the community, not because you put more effort in one place than the other. Okay, so evenness. This is another really important part. Um, so many of you probably had heard of species richness before, but maybe not species evenness. And this is the uniformity of abundance in an assemblage of species. Okay, and evenness or equitability is greatest when species are equally abundant. Okay, so we have greatest evenness when species are equally abundant. So if we again go back to this community here, we saw this community in our previous slide and we know that there are four species. And in this particular picture, each species is reflected by five individuals. Okay, so we have five individuals of each species. We have four species, so we've sampled 20 individuals. We found four species and we found five individuals of each species. These species are equally abundant in community B. If we look at community A, the story is really quite different. We have one representative of each yellow, orange, and um, pink butterfly. And then we have 17 individuals of the blue butterfly. And so you can see that this community is really dominated. We talk about the dominance. This community is dominated by, by species, by the blue butterfly species. And these orange, yellow, and pink would be very rare species in this community. In contrast, they're all equally abundant in this community. And so you have greater evenness down here than, than up here. And so then we move on to species diversity, which we hear a lot about, and a lot of times people conflate species diversity and species richness. Species diversity is not the number of species in a community. That is species richness. Species diversity is the number and frequency of species in a biologic assemblage. And so when we, species diversity is calculated, and it's calculated based on a combination of species richness, so the count of the number of species in the community, and species evenness, which is how, you know, what are the relative abundances of each species within a particular community. And so we combine those two measures, evenness and richness, to produce a measure of diversity. Okay? Um, and I'm going to show you one example. There are many, many, many different diversity indices. I'm going to show you probably the most common diversity index, the Shannon Wiener index or the Shannon diversity index, um, sometimes just the Shannon index. Okay, and so this is just going to, we're just going to walk through how you actually calculate the Shannon diversity index. And so we have our same communities here, our blue, yellow, pink, orange butterflies, Community A, where we have really, um, uh, you know, one dominant species and several, three rare species, and Community B, where we have fairly equal, or we have, we have equal abundances of all species. So we have a community that has species richness of four, and we have collected 20 individuals. And so in this community, we have 17 blues, one yellow, pink, and an orange. In this community, we have five for each of the four species. All right. Okay, so in, in the special case where you have equal abundances of all species, your, your Shannon index is fairly straightforward to calculate. You can just take the lawn, the natural logarithm of the species richness. So lawn of four equals 1.388. In all other cases, we have to do some calculations that take into account um, the evenness in the community, so what proportion of the total population each species is comprising across all of those different species, okay? And so, um, in this case where we've got this really uneven community, we, our first step is we've got a proportion, so blues make up 85% of the community, or 0.85, a proportion of 0.85. We take the natural logarithm of that, and of course anything less than one, and so because this is a proportion, they're all going to be less than one. Anything less than one is going to be a negative value. The closer you are to one, the higher the proportion of the population, the smaller the value is, right? So here we have 0.85, you take the natural logarithm of that, you get negative 0.163 um, in comparison to these um, 
these species that, that have a much smaller proportion of the population, we get a much larger lawn pi value. However, so this value is smaller, it gets um, to calculate Shannon index, it gets multiplied by this large proportion, but it still ends up being a fairly small value because this lawn pi value is small because this is close to one. And these are large values, say compared to this 0.25 down here, However, they're getting multiplied by a very small proportion. So point, negative 2.996 multiplied by 0 0.05 gives you a, a, pi, a pi times ln pi of negative, 1 point, uh, negative 0.15. Okay, and you sum all those values together. So the larger these are, the larger this sum is going to be, and then you multiply that sum by negative one to get the H index or the Shannon index. Um, when you have more equal abundances, your proportions are even. You're, you don't have any, you know, really large or really small lawn PIs, but those lawn PIs are all being multiplied out across by a, by a larger value, okay? A comparatively larger value for most of the cases, all right? And so we end up with these PI times lawn PI values that are larger than anything we see up here. Our total value here is minus 1.388. So that's exactly, you know, recall, if you take the lawn of four, you get minus one point, or you get 1.388, sorry. And we're gonna take, we're gonna take this value and multiply it by negative one. So we get exactly the same value. So we see that when we account for evenness within this community of four species, that we end up with a higher diversity in the community where we have exactly the same number of species, um, but the evenness here is greater than here, and so we end up with a higher diversity. Now this is a pretty simple case because we have the same number of species in each community. It becomes, of course, much more complex and you have this balance between richness and evenness that comes into play when you have species that are communities that have um, differing richness, um, differing richness, but also differing evenness, okay? So these calculations are not typically as simplistic as this, but this gives you a sense of exactly how you calculate it and how evenness is factored into um, into this calculation and how species richness is factored into this calculation. Okay, uh, these are just all the definitions for the different terms in here, um, but you should try calculating this yourself and trying to work through, um, trying to work through getting to those H values. Okay, <clears throat> now when we talk about biodiversity, this is a different term once again. Um, and this, this refers to the diversity of important ecological entities that span multiple scales from genes to species to communities, okay? And so in this diagram, we have this population of, maybe it's the same blue butterflies in our previous slide, we have this population of blue butterflies. You can see that they're variable and that this variability we know um, for many populations is attributable to genetic variability, so to genotypic dif uh, differences within the population. And those genotypic differences, that genetic diversity is incredibly important for maintaining variability within that species and giving that species the um, information it needs to be able to respond to uh, environmental challenges and to evolve through time. Okay, so what is happening within each population, within each species, and the, the genetic variation associated with that influences species diversity within the community as well. If you have very limited genetic diversity, maybe the species disappears, right? So this is what we've just been talking about is species diversity, species richness. This is actually a... Um, not well reflected here, but species richness is reflected here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six different species of insects depicted here. But maybe, you know, maybe the abundances of those different species are 
a function of that genetic diversity and how well that species can respond to environmental challenges, for example. Okay, so we have genetic diversity, we have population level diversity that's attributed to that genetic diversity um, within a species. We have species diversity, we have different species within a community and different abundances of those species. So we have differences in species richness, we have differences in evenness. Um, and, and that structure, that community structure, then dictates what's happening in the community. The interactions that happen within that community, within that ecosystem, that um, lead to the functions that that community provides, okay? Uh, and, and we'll get into, you know, for example, if you, you know, if your genetic diversity is reduced and you lose this butterfly from the system, what are the functional implications? And we'll talk about the importance of different species. Not all species are equally important in an ecosystem or in a community. Um, but if you lose that species, what are the implications for the community? So these are, you know, it's a hierarchical, when we think about biodiversity, we think about it in the context of, you know, a hierarchical structure where you have everything from genes right through to the, um, the community and even even further beyond that to you know the diversity of ecosystems that we have on the planet okay this is this definition is an, it, it's it's important because it recognizes the interconnectedness of these scales none of these scales are independent of one another and things that happen at the community scale feed back to both of these smaller scales as well and so recognizing that interconnectedness is very important. Okay, so we talked about characterizing species and how you do that. Maybe you go out with your quadrat, maybe you do your capture mark recapture, maybe you go out and do some counts along a transect. But regardless, um, one of the important things to keep in mind is that the effort you put into that sampling will determine how many species you are going to find. Okay, so this is what we talk about when we're thinking about, you know, species area relationship or um, sampling effort. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so one way we look at whether we have captured an entire community is by to create something is by creating something that we refer to as species accumulation curve. This is a cumulative number of species that we encounter as a function of area, or if you're working with, you know, mobile organisms, maybe it's the, the, the cumulative number of species that you encounter as a function of your sampling intensity, so the number of individuals you sample, okay? And we can look at that. We, there are ways, this, basically, all of those species accumulation curves, whether you're looking at the individual level or on an area basis, look like this, where initially you have a very steep rise where every time you go out and do some sampling, you're catching more species. Your cumulative number of species, so this is on the y-axis, this is your total number of species, the cumulative species that you've sampled, um, or our species richness. And here on the x-axis, it's your sampling effort, whether it's area, whether it's number of individuals, whatever it happens, whether it's time that you've spent sampling. So sometimes we hear about catch per unit effort. This may be the amount of time you're out sampling. Um, and the more effort we put in, initially, the more species we find. And this is why it's really important to make sure we're, when we're comparing two communities that we're comparing them at equal sampling intensities. All right. And so we have sampling effort, it increases, and then eventually you get to a point where you have sampled every species in that community. You cannot find another new species. And so we reach this asymptote or this plateau where no more species, no, it doesn't matter if you put more effort into it, you are not going to find more species. And this, this plateau, this asymptote reflects this, the true species richness of that community or of that subset of the community that you're interested in, okay? So if you sample over here, you have not captured the full species richness. You can certainly compare that to another community that you also sample at a comparable sampling intensity, but that doesn't tell you if those two species, those two communities will cross and one will become richer than the other eventually. So what you really want to do when you're thinking about sampling 
is to sample with sufficient intensity that you've reached this plateau, but you don't go way out here and put too much effort into it. So it's sort of a, a balance between sampling effort and, um, you know, just you, you really want your sampling effort to be just enough so that you actually capture that true community. And we can see this reflected here um, in this example. So the, in this particular uh, study, these individuals sampled um, uh, temperate forests, tropical birds, bacteria in, in the mouths of humans, uh, tropical moss, and, and soil bacteria in the tropics. Okay, and what we see is five very different species accumulation curves. So this is the, so they, they standardize these because you can't compare if you're sampling human mouths versus temperate forests versus tropical birds. You can't, you can't um, use the same sampling units. But they sampled them, but they, they compared them by, by put, plotting them along a proportion of individuals in samples um, uh, on the, on the x-axis. And so this is a, a measure of sampling effort. It's how many individuals did you, were there, uh, of the total number of individuals sampled were in a given, in, in a given sample. And this is the proportion of species observed in samples. And so we can see for all of them, we see this initial really rapid increase. For temperate forests and for tropical birds, we definitely see this plateauing like we see here. So we've reached somewhere over here when we, when we get over to this edge of the graph, we've reached, you know, we've almost reached that, that plateau in our, in our curve, okay? What we see for both, for all three, human oral bacteria, tropical moss, and tropical soil bacteria, is that those curves are still really rapidly increasing. So these are situations where you'd say, yeah, well, I do not know the true richness of this system because, you know, this is still increasing at a linear rate. That means it's going to, you know, flatten out somewhere way over here. Okay, so if you, you know, that may be fine. It depends on what your goals are, but this is just to demonstrate that you can find creative ways of comparing very different types of, of richness. But whatever you're using, this, this is the logarithmic relationship that kind of reflects that, okay? So in this case, we have species equals C, which is a constant, times area. This could also be time, this could also be individuals, um, raised to the power of Z, which is also a constant, okay? And so what it breaks down to is that the number of species you sample is a function of your sampling intensity. In this case, area, but again, this could be individuals, this could be, um, this could be time. So when we think about this from an ecological perspective, this has really important implications when we're, con when we're contemplating biodiversity loss in the face of habitat degradation and habitat loss. If you reduce the area available, you reduce the species. So we know that as we shrink habitats in different um, ecosystems, that what we are doing is reducing the number of species that are, that are found in those ecosystems. And so this has some direct kind of conservation um, implications, this, this particular relationship. But from the perspective of understanding communities, it's really important to acknowledge that the more you fi will find more species as you increase your sampling intensity. Um, and this, this relationship describes that and these, this Z will dictate where that plateau happens. But, um, anyway, this is, this is really important to keep in mind when you are doing any kind of species-based sampling. Okay. So we also have a range of interactions and we can describe those interactions in different ways. So again, in communities, we're talking about you know, all of the species in the community. Not every species in a community is going to interact with one another. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that a species that one species that doesn't interact with another species doesn't have an impact on that species. And this is really important to think about when you're, when you're contemplating the ways, the way communities work is that we can have, both direct species interactions, and this is interactions where two species are directly interacting with one another. These can include trophic and non-trophic interactions. Um, so trophic interactions being feeding, feeding interactions, non-trophic interactions being other, you know, other interactions. Maybe it's competition, maybe it's um, um, 
some kind of mutualism, for example. Um, but we have these direct interactions and we see some of these reflected here. So for example, this otter is a car carnivore. We've already heard about this example. This otter is a carnivore, it consumes these sea urchins, okay? So the, the otter has a direct negative impact on the sea urchins. The sea urchins feed on kelp. So the sea urchins are herbivores that consume kelp. Direct negative interaction of sea urchins on kelp. The sea, urchin, the, the, the sea otter doesn't necessarily interact with the kelp, okay? It doesn't, doesn't feed on the kelp, um, doesn't use the kelp for, you know, uh, nesting area or like, uh, you know, resources for its home, etc. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the otter, as we know, doesn't have an impact on that kelp. And this is where indirect interactions come into play and are really important and, and really tricky because they're, you know, we won't necessarily identify them a priori uh, as being important, but then, you know, when, when a species is removed from a system, all of a sudden these indirect interactions become very apparent. So indirect interactions occur when the relationship between two species is mediated by a third species, okay? So in the case of the otter, we have this trophic cascade where the sea otter consumes the sea urchins. The sea urchins feed on the kelp, so the more pressure the sea otter puts on the sea urchins, the less pressure the sea urchins are putting on the kelp. And so there's an indirect positive effect of the sea otter on the kelp. And so this is the situation where um, an enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of situation, okay? So the urchin is the enemy of the kelp from the kelp perspective. The otter is the enemy of the urchin from the urchin perspective. And so as a consequence, the otter is the friend of the kelp. As the otter consumes more urchins, pressure on kelp is reduced and those kelp beds are maintained. And we recognize this when, when otter was removed from the system, all of a sudden, urchins proliferated and totally demolished these kelp beds. We've learned about this example already. And so this is a really great example of a trophic cascade and a really important indirect interaction that um, helps to maintain these systems. Uh, we also can see examples of trophic facilitation. Um, in this case, uh, we have a situation where uh, th these are salt marsh plants. We have um, juncus, uh, juncus, which is uh, uh, sedge and um, iva, which is a shrub, okay? And juncus has a direct positive impact on iva in two ways. First of all, it provides some shade. It's a little bit taller than iva. It provides some shade. It reduces evaporation from the soil surface. This is a salt marsh environment, so evaporation means concentration of salt in the soils. So reducing the evaporation reduces the soil salinity somewhat, which has a positive impact on IVA. Um, juncus also has arenchymous tissue, okay? And arenchymous tissue is basically, basically hollow um, tubes that go through the plant tissue that support gas exchange. So it carries, um, they've evolved to carry uh, carbon dioxide from the roots to the atmosphere, so you don't have too much carbon dioxide, there's respiration happening, these roots are functioning, there's respiration happening, it carries carbon dioxide away from the roots, but it also, via diffusion, carries oxygen toward the roots. And so when you have a species that has arenchymous tissue, it helps to oxygenate the soils. This is a salt marsh environment, these soils flood, and so the oxygen concentrations can be quite low. Um, this oxygenation of the soil by juncus helps to maintain root function of IVA, which it does not have arenchymous tissue. And so IVA, or juncus, helps to support IVA in two ways. IVA has a direct positive impact on aphids. The aphids feed on IVA. You could, you could imagine the reverse as well, that, that um, the presence of aphids has a negative impact on IVA. Um, but we're going to think about it in this way because there's this, um, you know, aphids that feed on IVA do much better on IVA when juncus is present. So the IVA is much healthier when juncus is present and as a consequence provides a better food resource for the aphids. So as a consequence, juncus has an indirect positive effect, an indirect benefit for those aphids 
without Juncus there, the aphids actually drop off and or uh, the aphid population drops off and, and, and uh, drops off to extinction locally. And so it's this, the, reason, the reason this is depicted this way is because without Juncus, Iva does really poorly and often doesn't continue to exist because the soils are too saline and the soils are too anoxic. Um, without Juncus, this aphid does not continue to exist locally because the um, Iva plant is doing poorly and can't support the aphid population. And so it's this sort of three-way positive interaction with direct positive effects of between Juncus and Iva and between Iva and the aphid and an indirect positive effect between Juncus and the aphid. So this is trophic facilitation and you remember those positive interactions between species is facilitation. Okay, just moving on to, to further elaborate on that, um, we see some data of photosynthetic rates. So this is in micromoles of carbon dioxide per meter square per second, photosynthetic rates of Iva um, so our shrub species with and without juncus. So the blue bars are with juncus, the, yeah, the orange bars are without juncus. And we can see that consistently throughout the growing season, so June, July, August, photosynthetic rates of IVA are reduced when juncus is not present and they're increased when juncus is present. So that oxygenation of the soil, that reduction of the salinity of the soil really helps to maintain a higher photosynthetic rate um, in IVA when juncus is present. And population growth rate is even more dramatic. So the population growth rate is more than twice, in the presence of Juncus, the population growth rate is more than twice that in, in where Juncus is absent, okay? And indeed, in August, we start to see population decline of IVA compared to a, a, a continued increase in the presence of Juncus. Okay, so, Population growth rate is really severely impacted, physiological function impacted, population growth rate impacted, and then this is the number of aphids throughout the growing season. Um, and we can see that where juncus is present, the number of aphids, the population size increases. Where juncus is absent, that population size is not able to maintain itself and drops off and eventually will go to, toward extinction. Okay, so, some data to support that trophic facilitation, but really interesting indirect impacts of Juncus on that aphid population. Okay, next up is competitive networks. Another example where this, this sort of term, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, comes into play. Because in this context, we have, let's say we have three species. All of these species interact in different ways. So um, we have kind of in this, in this situation we have species C having a direct negative impact on species A, species A has a direct negative impact on species B, and species B has a direct negative impact on species C, okay? So in this sort of circular view, there's um, kind of a regulation of population sizes, there's indirect interactions amongst these species because species, so species C has a negative impact on species A and as a consequence it has an indirect positive impact on species B because species A has a negative impact on species B, okay? So when species C reduces species A, this reduces this pressure on species B but this isn't going to, in the case of this sort of linear view, those relationships, you would have this situation where species A always won out because species A has a negative impact on species B, which has a negative impact on species C. Without that feedback of species C to species A that we have here, what we will have in this interaction is species A always coming to dominate the um, system. In this context, because each of these three species has a negative impact on one of the other, there's regulation of population size of all of these. And so the example in your text, and I wasn't able to come up with a lot of examples to be honest, so I'm using this example from your text, um, 
and I, and I think probably these kinds of circular competitive networks are really hard to identify. Um, but the, the example I give in your text is, is from coral reef systems. Um, and these, you know, populations of encrusting invertebrates and algae that occur there. Uh, the, the researchers who were studying these interactions, so basically there's competition for space, okay? So you've got all of these encrusting, so these different species that kind of grow on these hard, hard surfaces of the corals. And the more space they have, the, the larger their population size is. Um, so they're competing with one another for space. And what the researchers did was measure at each of the intersections, they'd take samples and look at who was growing over top of whom. And within the species that they had in this diverse system, every single species both had the ability to overgrow other species and be overgrown by other species. So it's this situation where, you know, let's say this is species A, um, this is species B, and then there's species C growing in over here on top of this one. Um, as species A grows over top of species B, it expands its space, but species, species B is able to grow on top of species C over here, um, and species C is able to grow over top of species A. So you can imagine this situation where each species is able to overgrow one other species in that network, but also be overgrown by one other species in that network. And so in that way, it maintains the diversity of the system. So these competitive networks are thought of um, as a possible way that diversity in systems is maintained. It avoids this uh, you know, single species domination that we see when we think about the kind of linear um, competitive relationships. Okay, another really important thing to think about when we're contemplating species interactions is the inter interaction strength or the importance of the interaction, okay? And so the, the sort of importance of the species in the system is dictated by, by the importance of its interactions, the strength of its interactions with other species. So when we think about interaction strength, it's the effect of one species on the abundance of another species, all right? And so you can have a large negative effect, you can have a large positive effect, but the strength of the interaction is determined by how, how important that effect is on one species, of one species on another. And the way we measure this is by removing a species from the community and measuring the effect on the target species. And so if, again, we think back to that otter example, when otters were extirpated from the system, um, we saw this really big proliferation of uh, kelp in the system. And so we know that A, otters have a really big impact on sea urchins, and B, sea urchins have a really large interaction strength with, with kelp, okay? Um, and um, so, so when we think about the strength of that interaction, uh, how large that effect is, we can kind of classify species based on both, both the effect that they have on the community or the ecosystem and their relative size and abundance. So I'll show you another version of this that I think is a little bit clearer than the one for your text, but this is from your text. And we see here on the y-axis effect of the species. So it goes from small, so a species that has very little impact on any other species in the system, to very large. So a, a species that has um, impacts on, on a, you know, large impacts on a large number of species in the system. Um, and then we go from relative size and abundance of the species from small. So, you know, the species doesn't make up proportionally a large portion of the biomass in the system to very large where species makes up a, a high proportion of the biomass in the system. And this is how we classify um, kind of interaction or the, the role of species in communities. And so when you have a small relative size, but a large relative impact, or you kind of are um, punching above your weight class, so to speak, we refer to these as keystone species. So these are species that have large effects on the community despite their small size and abundance, okay? Or small biomass and abundance overall. In contrast, 
We can also have species that have a large impact but have a large overall biomass, and this is foundation species such as trees. So these have large effects on their community by virtue of their large size and their abundance. All right? And then we have a number of species that can either be common or be rare, make up a large proportion of the community or not a lot, but overall their total effect is small, okay? Um, and so for many of these species, they will, there will be a lot of redundance. Maybe they, maybe they share a similar function as some other species or multiple species in the system. So removing them doesn't have a big impact on the system. Whereas, you know, a keystone species, it, it perhaps is, you know, when you remove that, it doesn't have, there's no redundancy, there's no one else that plays the role that that species plays in the community. So by removing the otter, it has this big cascading effect on the ecosystem, okay? So foundation species, large effects on other species and thus on the species diversity of the communities by virtue of their considerable size and abundance. And that, they, you know, the most obvious example is trees in a forest, but you can also think about those kelp, um, uh, those, those kelp uh, in the kelp forests, they serve a very similar function. So often the large dominant photoautotrophs in the system play a role as a, um, as a foundation species. And so in the case of trees, you know, we have this foundation species where, you know, the tree itself provides habitat for other species, both the branches, the leaves, even the stems, if you think about, you know, boring, um, boring insects, wood boring insects, I should say, not boring insects, but wood boring insects. Uh, trees affect the, in, the microenvironment in the understory by shading, by retaining moisture, by reducing sort of stressful um, impacts of sun, wind, rain, and so they make the, the conditions in the understory more amenable for many, many species. Even the, even the dead bodies of trees can serve as really important um, resources for space, nutrients, moisture, they act as nurse logs. Um, yeah, so, so you, can, you can kind of go through this, but you can see how these, um, how trees in a forest really modify the whole environment and removing those trees from that system has, you know, profound implications for way, the way the system works, all right? And so this is, this is not so much because the trees themselves are doing something like a single tree would not, um, would not necessarily do all of these things to create that, that system, but because trees are, you know, in a, in a forest environment, they're, they're, they comprise so much of the biomass, they're so abundant, um, they're so uh, large that they play a really big role um, in structuring that system and the community dynamics within that system. Ecosystem engineers, this is a special class of keystone species, and I should have perhaps talked through keystone species first. Um, but ecosystem engineers are a type of species that modify or maintain the physical habitat for themselves or other species. And really the most obvious example is this beautiful beaver here. Um, this is a really common example where we know that beavers move, move around um, harvesting stems, creating dams, um, changing the hydrology of the system, and actually physically modifying that system. So, you know, here's an example from your text that it comes from this little top top central corner of uh top central portion of minnesota beavers for a long time were hunted for their pelts and in many places were um nearly extirpated from from regions and during that time the the you know you can see these red blobs on this map are the distribution of wetlands in that part of minnesota during that time okay so that was in 1940 1961, that, that fur trade had, had been reduced, beaver populations were rebounding, and you can see the much greater prevalence of wetlands on the landscape. So because the beavers are doing this kind of work, because they're changing the hydrology of the system, they're creating, um, they're, they're engineering their environment, they're modifying the, the physical environment, um, which, which really creates uh, 
you know, at the landscape level, much greater diversity of, of, of ecosystems, of species, you know, of the habitat available for different species, et cetera, of, even of, of functions. We can think about ecosystem functions and the diversity of those. And this continued by 1986, beavers had recolonized the region and wetland area had increased by 13 fold. So ecosystem engineers, but these are a special type of a special example, a special subset of keystone species. So these are species that have large effects, not because of their abundance, but because of the vital roles they play in their community. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so again, in this example, we have, um, we've already gone through this, but otters are a really tremendous example of a keystone species. Uh, they're not terribly, from a biomass perspective, not ter they don't make up a huge proportion of the um, community, but when you remove those um, otters from the system, you have a really big impact on the availability of kelp beds. And so that, that impacts a huge number of species because so many species rely on these kelp beds for, um, for their livelihoods. Okay. So we're almost done here, but um, this is just that example I was talking about. It's very similar to that first kind of panel that I showed you, but you know you have the impact of the species from low to high, the proportional biomass of the species from low to high. Um, you have these species that have a very large impact on the system, low biomass, they're keystone species, so this can be apex predators. We saw those examples from Yellowstone National Park. These can be various... Um, uh, various species like um, like otter that we saw, um, some pollinators, for example, or um, bats that can serve a huge, play a huge role in their um, community. So there's any number of keystone species, so they make it proportionally a small proportion of the biomass. In contrast to dominant species, which make up a large proportion of the biomass, but also play a really important role, okay? So it's really how common, how abundant, how much biomass does the species contribute to the system that dictates whether it's a dominant species or a keystone species. And then down here where we have low impact, you can either be really common and you're just a common species, but probably you're functionally redundant. Okay, so there's other species very similar to you. So if you're removed from the system, you don't have a big impact. Um, and then there's rare species that have low proportional biomass, low impact, and are just not, not terribly important to the system aside from a biodiversity perspective. Um, we don't, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to say that you need to sort of demonstrate that functional redundance um, of a species. Okay, and so last but not least, um, species interactions are context dependent. And so this is so important to think about when we're contemplating the environmental changes we're seeing with climate warming, um, or that we see with habitat loss and fragmentation that, that, that you know, the context of the interactions can dictate how those play out. And so a great example of this comes from uh, some streams in California. You have this primary producer, Clodophora, and so here we have a, a food web, right, with in this case one, two, three, four levels. We've got our primary producer, primary consumers, our secondary con consumers, and our tertiary, tertiary consumers. Clodophora algae, which is a filamentous algae, is the primary producer. Um, what typically happens during a normal year, you have um, substantial flooding in the spring, which really scours those streams and removes a lot of these um, um, caddisflies and other, other uh, organisms from the system. This allows Cladophora to grow rapidly because it's consumed by these caddisflies to grow rapidly. Eventually, it produces a mat that floats up. The midges use this uh, to, to weave together their homes um, to produce offspring, etc. Those midges serve as food for various small predators, dragonfly larvae, small fishes, etc., who then are the food resources for these two tertiary consumers, the steelhead and, and roach. Okay? And these armored um, insect larvae, the caddisflies, they feed to a lesser extent on Cladophora. Okay, so this is under a normal year. Under a dry year, under drought conditions, there is, uh, we do not see that same scouring of the system. So as a consequence, these guys don't, 
get taken out of the system or their population doesn't get reduced due to that scouring. So they start feed very heavily on Clodophora. This leads to a situation where there is not a bloom of Clodophora, not a really a, 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 a flush of Clodophora growth. And so you don't have these big mats being produced. As a consequence, the midge population declines, which has impact implications for the small predators and these tertiary consumers, okay? So w under drought conditions, this goes from being, you know, a four level food web to basically a two level food web, all right? So it's really important to think about these environmental conditions, think about the context of the interactions and how that may modify the interactions you're seeing within a community. Okay. That's all I have to say today. We will um, be finishing our uh, section on communities next week. Um, I will I will post the, a, a second um, a lecture on chapter 17, which is the second chapter on communities next week, as well as a lecture on ecosystems. Uh, this Thursday, don't forget, we have Dr. Deanna Strahl joining us from the Canadian Forest Service on Thursday at 5.30 in our synchronous session. Um, I will be posting the title of her talk on my learning space later today or tomorrow. So stay tuned. Um, but I will, I'll, if I don't see you tomorrow during student hours, I'll see you on Thursday for our Meet the Scientist night. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Mm -hmm.